Welcome. I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We build solid foundations for service-based businesses to grow and scale, and you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. Do you get paid enough for what you do? Are you charging what you're worth? Do you market yourself as the low-cost provider of goods and services? Are you tired of not having enough money in the bank and working harder but not getting where you want to go? Well, on this episode, we're going to explore a concept that can potentially be transformational in every way. Our guest is best described as an entrepreneurial futurist. In other words, he specializes in future-proofing businesses. But don't worry, we'll get into more detail about that. He's been an author for over 20 years, has written 14 best-selling books, and has shared his business advice, wisdom, and strategies to audiences around the world. His impressive list of clients includes the European Union, CBS, and Hewlett Packard, and he's been featured in a number of prestigious media outlets such as Inc. and the Huffington Post. Please welcome the author of Someone Has to Be the Most Expensive, Why Not Make It You, Andrew Griffiths. Andrew. Good morning, Jay. How are you doing? Uh, it's always hard to live up to that kind of introduction, isn't it? Well, there's a lot there, but <laughs> that barely scratches the surface, which is really the interesting piece to this. But thank you for being here and good morning to you. The absolute pleasure. So I thought that a good starting point for us would be the incredible journey that you've had up to this point. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been filled with an extraordinary life and extraordinary life experiences. So, and I've got to share with you that the word resilient just isn't strong enough based on what I've read, what I've seen, and what I've heard in the conversation that you had, you and I had in the past. So share with us, if you will, some of the early lessons that you learned that have shaped who you are today. Mm, um, I, I, I guess if you go, if you go right back uh, for me, uh, my, my, my start in life was, was an unusual one. Uh, I'm an orphan. And so uh, my parents had uh, abandoned myself and my sister. I was six months old and she was 18 months old at the time. And uh, we ended up uh, living in, in uh, really difficult situations. This old lady took us in, but she was a little bit crazy. And there was, I, I had one of those childhoods that had a lot of violence and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear uh and, and and a lot of those kind of elements and that you know when when you have that kind of childhood that tends to lead to fairly predictable uh predictable events you start to run off the rails you start to get involved in alcohol and drugs and crime and you, you're trying to find a tribe you're trying to fit in you, you you're trying to find your sense of worth and value and uh and my, my entire childhood was was a, a difficult one, like many, many people. I mean, I haven't even got a birth certificate. I don't actually know when I was born or where I was born. So it was, uh, it led to in and out of uh, being in and out of institutions and things along those kind of lines. But I do remember that there was a really pivotal moment for me. And when I was in my uh, teens, I was around 17, I think it was. And I was literally standing at the front of the house. I'd long been sleeping on couches and, and share, living in houses uh, where I could. But I really made this, this, uh, this moment was very pivotal for me because it was one of those, uh, which direction do I go, left or right moments? I was waiting for my group of friends to pick me up Friday night, go out drinking drugs, all of the usual thing. And I just remember having an epiphany of a moment where... I was standing at the front. It actually felt like a, a bolt of lightning or a ray of sunshine hit me and said, you have a choice. You go left or you go right. Today is the day you choose. And it was powerful. I still get a shiver up my spine when I think about it. It was such a vivid moment. And one way led to a very predictable future. You know, mm -hmm. pain, probably jail, probably hurt, probably death, probably all kinds of horrible things. Um, and the other way was 
to break away to I don't know what, but to become my own man and to not go down that path, an alternative. I was lucky I turned the right path and that uh, I turned the right direction. And that I, I literally packed my bag and I left town. I moved to uh, a place I'm in Australia, obviously. And I moved to a place called Townsville, which was thousands of miles from where I was living in Sydney. And I, and I started a new life. And, uh, and, and that, that was that moment where, again, I, I think my big lesson there was where you're from doesn't really matter. It, it's all about where you're going. And about six, eight months later, I actually ended up buying my first business. I was 18. I had no idea what I was doing. And I bought a scuba diving shop. I knew how to dive. I'd learned how to dive somewhere down the line, but I bought a dive shop 30 miles from the ocean. Now, I don't know if anyone sees any problem with that, but you could tell that my business acumen was not strong. And, and it was ironic, Jay. I, I had no business role models. I, there was obviously no kind of entrepreneurialism in my life. But the next thing, I, I, I in the 80s, when you could walk into a bank and ask them for money, it wasn't a lot. It was like 25 grand or something. And I remember walking out with a check and, and, and literally buying my first business and uh, and then kind of realizing, okay, what, what do I actually have to do? And and of course, dismal, I, I, I had no idea what I was doing. So that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey, I guess, 35 years ago. Um, for, it's just been one long lesson since then. I get up most days now and, and I think I know less about doing business today than I did back then because of the, the sheer nature of the enormity of understanding business. Well, well, it is interesting how in, in many areas of life, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. Mm. And it's just a matter of being exposed to, to knowledge. And there is so much, much to learn. And I, I want to unpack a, a, a couple of things. So the entrepreneurial journey piece is always an interesting one and starting your own business and what you learned through that experience that you carry with you today. One aspect of it is location, right? Mm. But something else that you mentioned about being at that, that pinnacle point where you could either go one direction or another direction. And thank goodness you chose the direction that you did. Had you up to that point, can you, can you point to what created that, that bubbling up sense of urgency that it's now's the time it's either this way or that way. Had you, had you been involved in some coaching or some mentorship or something that you had read? Was it just a, a series of your, your upbringing and past experiences that you dealt with? Can, can you point to anything in particular? I get asked that question a lot. And I get asked also, um, it's surprising that I, that I turned out as well as I did, you know, as a, the standing kind of line. Um, I, I don't really believe that there was, there was that one kind of moment. I think when you have that kind of childhood, I mean, I say to people, you know, first 17 years of my life was spent being told by people that I had no value. And I spent the rest of my life proving them wrong. Um, but it, I, I was fortunate. I, I'm an incredibly optimistic person as well. And, and I think I have a very, uh, I've got the optimism gene. And, and, I, and I look at that and that I, I was positive. But it was more, not so much that I was pulled towards something. It was more that I was pushed away from something because what I noticed in my world, and I was very fortunate that I was aware enough to see this was an escalation. And, and, and I mean, what's with drugs, with alcohol, with the people that I was hanging out with, you could tell that there was an escalation that was only heading in one direction. And, and that was bad. It wasn't like all of a sudden we were all going to find our purpose and go off and do good things. And all of those kind of people have either ended up in jail, dead, or, or somewhere along the lines when I look at it. And, and it becomes very clear. So that I knew. But you know that we talk about this. The problem is our peer group. When, when you've had a, a troubled childhood, all you want to do is fit in. And you find a peer group that accepts you. You talk to heroin addicts, they say their peer groups accept all of their bad behavior unconditionally because they know what it's like to be a heroin addict. Um, in that environment, you're, you're with a peer group that, that, that is, you've got to fit in because it's such a strong thing to fit into a peer group. To break away from it is very hard. And one of the greatest lessons I've learned in my life is to always live life to the beat of my own drum. 
I'm my own man. I always will be. Peer group pressure uh, only taught me bad things. And, you know, in business, I, I think I've learned that as well with listening to my own intuition, standing by my own integrity and my own values. Ironically, having a childhood void of much in the way of integrity and values and all the rest of it has made me so strong in that space because I never want to go that to that. Um, and it taught me values. And, and I did have some really good, a, a couple of mentors who were working for me when I bought my dive shop. And uh, older and wiser guys who taught me about dealing with people. And I have one chap in particular, great guy. He lived in Papua New Guinea for many years. So, and in Papua New Guinea, it, the, pe the, the people that go and live up there are either missionaries, mercenaries, mercenaries or misfits. They, they fit into one category. And he was kind of all three. And mm -hmm. of course, I, I, I was 17 or 18. I knew everything as you do it at that age. And he was double my age. And he had this wonderful, uh, wonderful way about him, which was about how to interact with people, how to how to be how to temper that eighteen year old ego, and how to be kind and considered with others. Because I didn't really, I wasn't very good at that. I didn't really understand that. And he very subtly, like, gave me a copy of How to Win Friends and Influence People. After he'd just quietly just seen me interacting with a few people, and 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 would we would have these conversations in the truck going to dive jobs and things like that where we talk about and it was just a lovely mentor that was able to to show me an alternative way about respecting people about respecting yourself about communicating about being fully engaged and present and uh and uh i, I probably learned more about that stuff and it started this wonderful um passion that i have for interactions with others communication empathy understanding to put yourself in the shoes of others and that really has been the common theme for me jay in all my writing and all of my speaking and all of my business work particularly right through to today incredible you know it's it's interesting that you brought up how to win friends and influence people and that that book entered your life at around 18 mm. so that book came into my life in my early 20s. And it was a life changer for me when I entered the corporate world. The company that I went to work for had put me through a Dale Carnegie course. Mm. And it was actually a course on human relations. And it was all about engagement and relationship building and the like. And it my mind was blown. I mean, my mm -hmm. eyes just opened up to a whole new world. So it's amazing how, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a book, a combination of the two, how certain messages can resonate with you and make and be so impactful and, mm -hmm. and create such transformation. So let, let's, I, I just want to go back to the dive shop for a moment. What were, t talk about some of the interesting things that you learned through that experience. So going into it, you didn't have experience with, with business, but you learned, you, I'm sure you asked lots of questions. There were probably some failures along the way that you were able to, to figure out how to overcome, but sh share some of that with us. And what were the major takeaways from that experience? Mm -hmm. the, the thing for me and, um, for sure, there's so, so many, so many experiences. I knew how to dive. I was a dive instructor. I, I got my qualifications. I was a commercial diver. I knew how to do that kind of work. But of course, that doesn't mean you know how to run a business. It means you know how to blow bubbles and breathe underwater with a scuba unit. Or, and uh, I bought, I, I'd worked in this dive shop for a little while from um, the guy that I bought it from, who was a Canadian, mad, mad guy. He was, uh, it was hilarious. But he, ran, he had no business acumen. Uh, so all I did was I ran the dive shop the way that he ran the dive shop, which is, of course, you, you, you just, you know, like, so to run a dive shop successfully, in my view was you had to have really cheap gear because pe that's what people wanted. They wanted cheap gear because that's what he sold. Um, we, we were totally price driven on our courses, on everything we did. The, like the dive shop had to look like a dive shop. So that meant you had to have fish nets on the wall. You had to have plastic crabs on the wall, plastic starfish. Your dive instructors had to look cool. They had to have ponytails and earrings. And, uh, and, and you had to be kind of like the, you know, the, the Key West kind of dive shop kind of model. 
And, uh, and, and of course, it, there's a certain degree of that that makes sense, but the, the profitability part of it, the making money part of it, the marketing part of it was just terrible. I mean, I got to know my bank manager because every morning they would pop by and give me the checks that I bounced the day before. I mean, I had no idea and I was just going backwards and backwards and backwards because I didn't understand profitability. I didn't really understand selling. I didn't do anything. I just looked at other dive shops and I did exactly what they did. And, uh, and I thought that that was the way to make money. And I would go more and more down the, the line of you know, losing money and, and going closer to going bankrupt all the time. Um, and, and it was really... It's, it's a longer story, but the abbreviated version of it was that, you know, I reached that critical point where I, I had to change. And, uh, and a guy came along who was recommended to me, who was a, a business advisor. And he said, look, I, I can change your business. I can show you where you're going wrong. And of course, you know, I said, how much is that going to cost? And back then it was $5,000. And I laughed. I said, I can't afford to put petrol in my truck and drive home. Uh, how, how am I going to, you know, I can't afford to pay you $5,000. So anyway, a little while later, I, I literally won $5,000 in some lottery thing. And I, my brain said, $5,000, $5,000. So I gave him this money. And uh, he came along and looked at the business. And, uh, and he gave me this list of ideas that he thought I needed to implement. And I looked at this list and, and you know, my heart sank. It was ridiculous. It was like triple the price of your gear. It was put your dive instructors in suits, get rid of most of your stock, get rid of the fishnet off the walls you know you can't run a dive shop without fishnet on the walls and uh and i just thought oh my god another great business idea andrew you know you've lost another five thousand dollars which was almost a nail in the coffin um they I, I put it in the drawer and forgot about it and just continued going broke and uh anyway i reached a point where it really was totally critical now. This was it. I had, I had no money anyway. So now I had supplies that were taking legal action. My landlord was, it was all turning pretty bad. And I, and I was a kid. I, I was maybe 19 at that stage. And, uh, and I, maybe a little bit older, but, a, you know, still a kid. And I finally, I, I vividly remember pulling out that bit of paper. It was a one page sheet of his recommendations. And I looked at them all. And I, now I was desperate enough. And I said, okay, I just got to do what this guy says. And, uh, and it was, you know, the, 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 all of the concepts, like we literally shut the shop. I got a whole pile of volunteers in. We, we borrowed some paint and stuff from a building site up the road, painted the inside, got this new carpet from somewhere that was put, like we put the carpet in, no idea how to do that. We got these prints. I took all of my dive instructors who were all basically volunteers down to the local Goodwill store. Is that the same in your neck of the woods, like charity store? And they all got yes. badly fitting suits. We lined up and did a ceremonial cutting of the ponytails. You know, all of this stuff. And as I'm doing it, I'm you know, throwing out the fishnet, the plastic crabs and seahorses and stuff. And as I'm doing it, you know, even my dive instructors are all going, this is ludicrous. This is ridiculous. And I hadn't read the last paragraph of what he had put in that one page thing. And, uh, and what it said was, Andrew, someone's got to be the most expensive. It may as well be you. But if you're going to be the most expensive, you have to be the best. And this means the best in service, the best in equipment, the best in teaching standards, the best boat, the best blah, blah, blah. And that hit me. Because then I kind of went, wow. My whole thing was, oh, no, people can't afford to, buy, to pay this much and do this and rah, rah. And I made that assumption. And, and it was interesting. As soon as I changed that assumption um, and it, everything changed. And at the same time as I was doing this refurb thing, um, a guy who was selling dive equipment uh, came to see me. I'd known him for a long time. He was a good guy. And he used to get irritated with me because I sold cheap, terrible gear. And finally, he said to me, he said, okay, I've had enough of this. Why are you selling this cheap gear? And he says, because what people want. And he said, I'm going to prove you entirely wrong. And he said, what gear do you use? And I said, I use your gear. You know that. That's the best. And he said, why do you use it? And he said, and I said, because my life depends on it. So why on earth would you sell cheap crap gear to other people? And, and I really couldn't answer that. Anyway, we opened up the shop and I, own, I got rid of all, I had one set of old cheap gear 
got rid of the rest and just stocked it with the most expensive gear on the market, all the rest of it. And interesting enough, it wasn't, you know, we, we open up and a lot of our regulars were freaked out, but our regulars were the wrong clients. They were the cheap clients. They had no loyalty. They were buying from either whatever dive shop they could get something for five bucks cheaper. They were buying it from. So there's no loyalty. So we opened, business dropped. And, and it was like our gear, we were three times more expensive for dive courses than anyone else. We, our equipment was so expensive. But what happened was then we started doing some marketing and we become a boutique. We're in a fairly wealthy suburb. All of a sudden people were coming from all, this was in Sydney, all over Sydney to buy equipment from us because it was said we were different, we're expensive, but we're the best. You came to us and, and I remember lining up this set to gear. Someone would walk in normally and I'd say, that's a thousand dollar set of gear. That's what you should buy. It's the cheapest, you know, best value. Now I'm going, okay, there's cheap set of equipment. And then there's, this is the equipment that we use. It's three times the cost. And we use this because our lives depend on it. If you want the cheap stuff, sure, we understand, you know, we put more value on our life. I never sold a cheap set of equipment ever again in that shop. In fact, I had to get rid of that set because it got so tatty just from being in the shop. All we sold was expensive gear. We had a weekend sale two weeks later. I sold 200 wetsuits in one weekend. I hadn't sold 200 wetsuits in two years mm. at triple the price. You could buy them cheaper. You could get them cheaper from elsewhere. But our service was extraordinary. Our you know, our dive courses were extraordinary. And we learned this concept of what does it really mean to be the best? So I look at that and you say, you ask me, Jay, what, what were my lessons? What's that? That was my school. That, that was my university of small business in that I learned so much about myself and so much about managing myself, managing people, understanding, etc. But it's ironic that 35 years ago, I learned that lesson and it comes full cycle into me writing this book now because I talk about the stuff that I learnt back then. I used to talk about it then, but the difference is I talk about it now and I believe it. I, I, you know, a lot of the things that I, like I, you know, how to win friends and influence people, I was fascinated with it, but I wasn't confident enough to believe it. Now I read that book every Christmas morning. It's my ritual. I watch It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart and I read How to Win Friends and Influence People on Christmas morning. It. I've read it 36 times now. And every time I read it, I get something new out of it that, that makes me go, have I never read this book before? So I, I, I look at that time in my life as my greatest learning and all of the values, regardless of the world we live in now with our technology and our um, fast moving uh, business world, world in general that we live in. And I go, the values that I picked up then and the lessons learned are even more important to, to me now in the current business climate than they were back then. Um, well, I, I, I wanted you to share that story and I asked you that question because we can read that in the book and we're going to encourage everyone to absolutely pick up a copy of the book. We're going to talk about that in more detail and we're certainly going to link to it. Nobody can tell that story better than you can tell that story. But that mm. story lays the groundwork for the book and everything that you're doing right now. And it gives mm. so much context around and there are so many lessons that came out of that experience that have allowed you to be able to tell the story that you do today and someone has to be the most expensive. And the so much was shared in what you just said. And I am hoping that everyone that's either watching or is listening to this is going to go back and listen to that commentary again on that story, because there are at a minimum six lessons that were shared in that. And we're going to unpack a few of those because I think they're important to point out, but it cannot be overstated the importance of learning those valuable lessons early on, but making sure that you're actually taking the learnings and then applying them. So let's, let, mm. let's take that story for a moment and then apply it to what you're doing today and some valuable lessons that those that are listening and watching can take away. One of which is ideal clients mm. and knowing who your ideal clients are. So 
the biggest point in all of that, which is really the basis of the book, is what you said was the last item on the list that was in the drawer, which is someone has to be the most expensive. Why not make it you? But you have to be the best, right? So let's talk about knowing who your ideal clients are for a moment. So share with us what your views are on knowing your ideal clients and what happens when you your business strategy is, I want to be the low cost provider so I can sell more and gain more market share. Yeah, great. Really good question too. It, it, it's wonderful to reflect uh, on that. The point that was so interesting for me was, um, which I didn't expect, was when we rebirthed the shop and it was different how our ex many of our existing customers didn't like it, didn't want to be a part of it because all of a sudden uh, we were expensive. They didn't see value. They were price driven. And uh, and I, I, I use a line and I, and I say this often, have you got the customers you really want or the customers you deserve? because often we end up with a certain type of customer because of the message we send, because if we're price driven, we've attracted them, all of those kind of considerations. What I've learned over the years is when you really, really know who your customers are and you can not only meet those expectations, but exceed those expectations, something that we've all heard, we, this is nothing rocket science about this, but when you get into that sweet spot of really knowing them and really empathize, really knowing them, not my customer is a 15 to you know, 20 year old, you know, uh, North American, blah, blah, blah. That's a demographic. That's all very nice. That to me is not knowing them. You know, when you really know your customer, your ideal customer, and you are committed to really exceeding their expectations in every way, that that's when kind of extraordinary things happen in business. I, I coach people to write books, Jay. And one of the things I say, one of the first things I say to people is to pick out your ideal reader, you have to have a visual picture of someone who you know well, who's your ideal reader. And you write your book to that person because then you're writing it so that it's, it's totally personal and engaging mm. um that and that's a that's a sounds like a little thing but i think in doing business i'm doing that when i'm doing this 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 wonderful interview with you jay i'm thinking about my idea right i'm about to go into studio for the rest of the day and do 50 videos and i'm constantly just thinking about my ideal customer is it's a lady called katrina i, I have three people that are the Katrina, Steve and, and uh, Carolyn. And I do everything I do to them because they're my perfect customers, my perfect clients. So really being defined on that, you got to know, well, what makes them perfect? And one of the, the challenges is if we do have a price driven structure and look, price driven can be a couple of different things. One can be we're, we're cheap, you know, we're, our, our entire business strategy is to be the cheapest world's worst strategy. Doesn't matter who it is. Right. We're the cheapest. So that can be the strategy. Or we have another strategy. We don't realize it. But as soon as we start talking to our customers, we start to discount before they even ask for a discount. You know that kind of thing when you're talking to someone, how much is that? Rara? Oh, but I can do you a deal. I didn't ask for a deal. Why, why are you giving me a deal? Why are you already doing that kind of thing? Um, so so the, there's those, you know, th that price-driven kind of strategy is very, very different. But what we want to do is once we make that commitment to be the best the difference that i see is that people start to seek us out you know that's what happened with my dive shop i worked on my geographical location but that's who i thought my customers were initially but no they were people that wanted the cheapest that would drive across town to get the cheapest regulator right because it saved the money so i literally attracted the cheapest and i sold them lots of gear and made no money out of it all I did was the same thing, but now I reversed it to be the most expensive and the best. So we attracted people even further afield who were prepared to pay for the best. And I learned at a very young age, there are always people who were prepared to make the effort to buy from the best because there's, an, there's a connotation that comes with being the best. Now, there's a connotation of quality, of safety, of reliability, of et cetera, et cetera, whatever it might be. 
Sorry, I was just going to say, Jay, the transition from one to the other is the hard part. Because if you, as I did, embrace this concept of changing my business model, all of a sudden, you lose all your existing customers. And that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. And that's where most people waver at this, this transformation. Because, And I, I warn my front, you're going to lose stuff. You're going to lose a lot of your existing customers. You're probably going to lose some of your staff because they can't go from being the cheapest to most expensive. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. Rah, rah. Um, but once you get through that dip, you start attracting customers and you go, they're great. And you should be able to look through your client list or your customer list and say 90% of these people are my ideal customers. If you if that's the case, you got a great business, you know. In, in my view, yeah, that's I, I I love that. It's um, where you really focus, and and the point that I want to make sure that everyone is grabbing onto is that statement about being the best, and the fact that you looked at your business at that point and looked at all areas of that business to figure out where can we improve? What does Mm -hmm. the best mean to us and how do we get there? So what steps do we need to put into practice? Who do I need to surround myself with? Who, who, what, what staff is going to be on board with us that can execute on being the best that shows up as being the best that has, What am I going to let go of? All of those things matter. So when it comes to transforming our business and being the most expensive, it has to do with the amount of value that we bring to the market and how we present ourselves. So I I, I love that story. It's, It's an incredible one. Speak to, if, if you will, the different, so you talk about mindset mm. in the book and you talk about basically an abundance mindset versus scarcity. You use a different term for it. You use poverty uh, mm. as, as a mindset. Speak to that for a moment. And what happens if someone has a poverty type mindset, how that impacts and influences the decisions they make and the type of business that they build? Mm, sure. It's a, again, it, it's a big question and a, and a, a big part of why I wrote this book now um, is, is simply because I do see more of this poverty mentality in business um, or scarcity mentality because it's really, really competitive. And for a lot of people, they haven't got another strategy. Their only strategy is to sell on price. But what I look at, to use my own example, I mean, as I said, I, I grew up being told that I had little value. I was worthless. So, you know, that that was really drummed into me in, in horrendous ways as a child. And, uh, and, and I started life with a poverty mentality. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't value yourself, how on earth are you going to value what it is you do? And... and this book, and you rightly pointed out the key, this is a book about value. This is totally a book about value. And, and understanding that increasing our value and becoming the best is it, it has to go across many different layers, but it's, it's an internal thought process. And so for many people in business, um, they, they go down the cheapest route or they discount quickly. And I know people say to me, oh, I, every job that I quote on, I win. And I go, oh, that's a shame. And, and they go, but what do you mean? And I, and I said, yeah, you, you are clearly underselling yourself. Oh, no, we get them because we're the best. And you go, what? I tell you, if you're the best, you don't get every job you quote for. If you're the best, you get half of the jobs you quote for. And that tells me that you're at the right price point. You get every job you quote for, you are undercharging. And, uh, and we, you know, we, we've got so many thoughts that have locked us into place. And, I, and, and again, for me in the dive shop was you had to have fishnet on the wall. You had to be cheap. You had to sell cheap gear. You had to have ponytails and earrings and your instructors because that's how you were successful in a dive shop. To completely throw that was very uncomfortable. It was completely wrong. It was ludicrous. It was ridiculous. And every part of my body was going, this is the dumbest thing you can ever be doing. Other dive shops will laugh at you, rah, rah. But my, we get comfortable in our poverty state. I, I have come across and worked with 
so many businesses, Jay, that even if they were fully booked, they wouldn't be making a profit. Mm. Now think about that for a second, this concept of saying to someone, if your business was booked out 100%, you wouldn't be making a profit simply because they don't know their numbers. They don't know their, their they don't understand their business. They, they're not, oh, my customers can't afford anymore. Exactly. What does that tell you? Oh, well, we can't put our price up. No, you need better customers. Oh, but no one around. And I hear all these sweeping statements because we, we tell ourselves this, you know, BS to hold us in that place. Got to have fishnet on the wall. Can't do a dive shop without fishnet on the wall. It's impossible. Find me a dive shop that doesn't have fishnet on the wall. There are none because you can't survive. You know, we tell our stories. But then on top of that, we get very comfortable with the business owner struggle. Oh, you know, I've got to work 80 hours a week and it's tough and rah, rah. We get comfortable in our struggle. We get comfortable, learned helplessness, very common term, you know, and, and, you know, we hear about it, about like with baby elephants, putting a rope around its leg, it can't move. Um, when it grows up, it doesn't need the rope anymore. It just still stuck in that place. Right. Same as right. business owners. We, we get quite comfortable in the poverty mentality. That shift of going from, cheapest or undercharging or discounting too quickly or um you know winning all of your your quotes that you put out or, or you know all right there's a cheapness that comes from that you attract cheap clients cheap clients have no loyalty except to cheap you know you build a business that has no margin no fat in it and we see exactly what has happened now uh certainly in australia within a week of covid shutdowns and things happening hundreds of thousands of businesses shut down and you're going, well, th th there's a lack of, of resilience in business. There's a lack of, of financial resources. There's a lack of all of these things. Why? Because people aren't charging enough. They're not, there's not enough meat in the business to get through a tough time. And so all of these things, the minute we have a crisis, whatever it is, there's always another one. The first thing I see is all of those businesses that were close to the bone that go broke because their business model is broken. And, and, and it's like, well, you've got to make that move. Even if you don't go to being the most expensive, my message is, is charge more, charge more for what you're worth. And as you rightly pointed out in there, Jay, to be the best is there's so many different parts of the business that you address. It's not just your product. I mean, I quote a chap in, in the book, a friend of mine, he makes walking sticks that he sells for $85,000. Okay, $85,000 desks, like my desk here costs $300. He sells desks that are $300,000. Hard to imagine, right? His product is fabulous, but his product is only a simple part of the overall process. He tells a story about the timber where they got it from. I got mine from Ikea, right? You know, like he's... It's from this, this maple wood that he sourced out of South America and, you know, rah, rah, and, and the story and his craftsmen and how they ship it and how they package it and how he makes inlays for Rolls Royce out of the UK to go on the dashboard. One little square of timber that goes on a certain interior package, you know, that they source in Queensland, Australia for this one guy who can make these, this timber panel. So, he charges that. And I know we're not all going to charge $75,000, $85,000 for our walking, $600,000 for our desks. But every part of the business is exceptional, you know, and, and, and the best covers everything from our attitude to our culture, to our, to our, um, our understanding, our empathy, our, our exceeding expectations, all of those kind of things. So we can be here being the cheapest and be up here being the most expensive there's a whole array of places in between. My challenge, my, my, my hope is to get as many people that are stuck in that poverty space to move up because I know how hard it is when you're running a business that's making no money, when you're struggling, when you're fried, when you're, you're working your butt off. And you know what? You are really good at what you do, but you don't attract the right people because you, you, you attract people that want cheap. And you burn out, you get bitter, you get twisted, and you kind of go, Absolutely. Yeah. breaks my it, heart. It, 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 is, it is very troubling to see. But, you know, sometimes when we are, as a business owner, when we're 
in it every day, we don't have the same perspective. And sometimes when, you know, if we have someone else who is, who's not caught up in the minutia every day, who can look at the situation and gain better perspective and be able to point out those areas, be able to help and coach someone to be able to see those areas where they're maybe looking at things from a scarcity standpoint, or they're attracting Mm -hmm. a certain type of client. Or if you look at your, the number of clients that are calling back and complaining or slow pay or those sorts of things, it's important to start to look at that and see where are the trends? Why is that happening? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we attract what we put out and, you know, as you had, had mentioned, making that change and going through that transformation, it's not an easy process. But as you clearly point out in the book, as you do it, once you make the change, it's, it's like being able to breathe fresh air again, it lifts such a a tremendous weight off of you, because now you you enjoy what you're doing, you're working with clients that you enjoy working with, you're making more money, you're charging more, and your business itself is operating at a very high level and that's a process yeah that's it's completely different so there's there's a process to that and so uh, again i'm I'm gonna mention to to everyone that the book title is someone has to be the most expensive why not make it you again i would encourage everyone to go out and pick up a copy of this book and read it but make sure that you're reading it and applying it because there's so much value in this book. And that particular point cannot be overstated about value creation. So mm. I, I just a, a really amazing, amazing book. Thank I you. wanted to find out from you what today, as you, as you look at your, the experiences you've been through and all the amazing things that, that you're doing and have done, what are your keys to success in being able to reach your full potential in all areas of life? Mm. Um, that's, uh, again, a, a really good question. And it, I mean, I do a lot, of, a lot of coaching with people. I do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of things. And I, I, I'm all around the world. And, and, and I talk with so many business people and at all stages from startups, from kids starting up through to people who have been in business for 60 years, 70 years. I, um, and I love that. And I'm often asked this kind of question, what is it that, like, what, what are your keys to success? And uh, there's a few things. One is, uh, without a doubt, is I, I am extraordinarily curious uh, I, I'm curious and I'm interested and uh, curiosity is my number one virtue. If, if it can be called a virtue, I'm fascinated by everything. doesn't matter whether I'm a frustrated zoologist. I've traveled the world looking for animal experiences. I've been bitten, attacked, molested by every kind of animal on the face of the planet from great white sharks through to, you know, to, to, to bears, to whatever it might be. But, but I'm curious about business. I'm curious about how you make an iPhone case. I'm curious about, um, about the history of post-it notes. I'm curious about how you operate. I'm curious and I'm interested in others. And it is the greatest way to learn. I, I, I mean, every single person, I don't just learn. I mean, I, I think, I think it's very easy to just look at the the bigger names. It would be very easy to for us to all look at Tim Ferriss's The World and and and, and the you know whoever you know we look up to Anthony Robbins whatever it might be and they're great. Don't get me wrong, they're wonderful people to learn from. But I tell you, I learn my best businesses business lessons from a lady called Magda who's run a roast chicken shop for fifty years, or. Or, or, or Tony, the little kid around the corner here who's just started mowing people's lawns and what his angle is to get in the front door. Everyone is looking at these big names. And I go, man, you, you, the person you're walking by, the guy you're buying your coffee from in the morning, the you know whatever it is, there is so much we can learn from, from others. Uh, and if you take the time to ask. So that's, that's one of my biggest lessons. The second lesson is to understand exactly what value I do bring and to really know, okay, um, 
I understand the concept of value enormously. And, and I know, and I have to work on this all the time myself. I don't, I don't think this is just something that, you know, that happens naturally. We've all got it. We all have self-doubt. We all have, you know, our moments, but I, I know my value and I know how to deliver. And I'm, I'm, I'm very clear about what I want and, and more importantly, what I don't want. I've mm. built the business. that's perfect for me. You know, I, I don't want to build an empire. I don't have any staff. It is just me. And I do that decidedly. I don't, I don't want to be on the speaking circuit all around the world anymore. I've done that kind of stuff. I don't want to have a team of a thousand people. You know what? I, I want to go to beautiful places. I want to do really cool things with really cool people in really cool places. That's, that's part of my kind of mantra uh, on life. I, I want to influence and make a difference. I want to have deeper engagement and commitment. So I'm really clear about all of that stuff. And, and, and I think that when you know all of that, not just I want to turn over a million dollars a year, but I know all of that other stuff as well. I think that I've built a business. It's taken me 30 years to build this perfect business. But when you have it, you go, well, this is exactly what I've wanted. I've got freedom. I've got this. I've got all of that stuff. So, so that clarity of my goals, but not just a revenue goal, you know, the, the life goals um, is really important. The third one, and, and again, without a doubt, I think nothing new in this, but the quality of the people that you have in your life um, is so enormously important, whether they're virtually in your life, as in you, you know, read their books, you maybe do some of their programs, you, the, it could be the people around you, um, whatever it might be, but it, 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 there is no doubt at all in, in my world that, you know, I, I meet a lot of people and in business and the problem is nothing to do with them it's their peer group their peer group's negative their peer group is price driven they're all about cheap their peer group is not about quality their peer group is the kind of bitter and twisted business owner and, and you know caught up or the flaky you know we're dodging from idea to idea and idea but never actually doing anything so really knowing who and consciously having those right people um in your life i, I think uh, helpful and, and and i think another last sorry last part that i would add to that jay is I, i've spent my life working on myself i've done so much personal development stuff because i've had to you know like i, I came from a, a, a difficult environment and and you know like that's what happened then i mean i've it's not a pity fest but you know i had a major diving accident you know i, I couldn't dive anymore my sister died suddenly of a heart attack this a million, my, my dive shop that didn't end well. You know, I had a business partner that literally took the whole dive shop away. You know, mm. like I went on a holiday, came back and, and he loaded up trucks and took everything and, and it had, you know, it's like, oh my God, I lost half a million dollars. You know, life deals us with all, all of those kind of things, as we all know. I don't want to be a Hallmark card, but I've learned to let situations play out. I've learned to you know, make myself better. Every Friday morning at 10 o'clock, I ask myself two questions. How is my business better this week than it was last week? And how am I better as a man this week than I was last week? Mm. And it's a simple little, you know, routine. It's a simple little ritual that I have. Um, and some weeks I'm better and some weeks I'm not, you know, but at least I'm consciously trying to, to, to become better um, in, in all that I do. And, and I think that, I don't know whether it's an age thing, I'm 55, but this is stuff that I've been doing all my life. It's just that now I have more conviction towards it now than ever. Wow. Be beautifully said. And, you know, as you stated earlier in the conversation that our past doesn't define who we are. So no matter what the circumstances are, we, we can change, which is amazing about the human being but we have to be willing to do the work mm. and so you mentioned that you've done a tremendous amount of work on the personal development side are there one to two other books that you would suggest or recommend to our audience that have been helpful and impactful to you uh, for sure I, I mean uh, uh, look, I, I love Anthony Robbins. I mean, I guess some of my stuff is a little bit older. Unleash the Power Within was pivotal for me uh, in, in terms of learning how to manage my state and physiology and language and stuff like that. Um, as you can tell, I, I, I lean a little bit towards some of the, the older 
uh, people like Zig Ziglar uh, it was an, an old classic because they, they all taught me a lot of fundamentals. And, and I find that I reread them a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm a voracious reader now and, and I, read, uh, I read a lot of different things about uh, different, different ideas and different thoughts, um, in, again, across a very broad area. Um, but I, I keep going back to the old favourites more and more because I, I just find that the lessons in there for the world that we're living in now, like this morning, literally, I went and got coffee early on and I'm listening to Zig Ziglar. And, and I mean, Zig Ziglar feels very dated now. It feels like the old Texan drawl. It's like it feels old and all the rest of it. But he's talking about attitude, how you turn up. And, and we, we are living in a world that has got, uh, in business, uh, it's, everyone wants everything quickly. Everything else, if I build a funnel, if I, if I do an online course, if I do this, I'm going to make a million dollars. And you go, you know what? It's the people that have taught you to do that stuff that are going to make the million dollars, probably not you. Exactly. And there's so many basic fundamentals of, of humanness that I think we're not working on now. How to have a conversation, how to look someone in the eye, how to, how to be fully present and engaged. I mean, you go into a shop, when was the last time you had that? You know, like... <laughs> and make interactions matter manage your state you wake up feeling like crap and you go well okay that's up to me to change that so i i learned my best lessons in life from the louise hayes from all the, that older band of people you know even you know dale carnegie of course that we mentioned before i, I look at them all and go they have really helped me but I find being older and hopefully a little bit wiser, their messages are even more profound now. They're incredibly simple, but in the world that we live in, the biggest challenge I see is everyone wants everything now, but they're not prepared to do the work. And they're missing the fundamental elements of being able to get it, which is the ability to communicate with other humans, not in a sales letter, not in a sales email, not in a funnel related video, not in all of that kind of stuff, but as human beings. And, and learning to be acting with total integrity to, you know, to do all of that kind of stuff, build a reputation, not just, you know, make a quick buck. And I do feel there's a quick buck element in the world these days. Mm. Wow. So much wisdom you've shared there. So thank mm -hmm. you. So before I ask my final question to you, what, what message would you like to leave our audience with? Mm. I would like to leave your audience with a message that there has never been a better time to actually charge what you're worth. There's never been a better time to be the most expensive, but it won't happen easily. You know, you got to be prepared to do the work to get there. You can't just, I say you can't put lipstick on a wombat, which basically translates to you can't just triple your rates and be lousy at what you do. It, this, this model doesn't work that way. Um, my hope is that because it breaks my heart to see so many businesses and business owners really struggling, killing themselves, and because their model is broken. Look at your own model. Like you might buy my book and look at it and go, you know what? We're actually okay. Great. You know, we're on the right path. We're charging well. We're making plenty of money. We're doing great or you might bite and go you know what no i we're not we should charge more i hear it all the time you know my my family say it my staff say it but i've got this block use my book to help you get past that but ideally someone's got to be the most expensive it may as well be you right but if you're going to be the most expensive you've got to be the best and the purpose of my book is to help you get to that and and those businesses that make that transformation never look back they never look back it's just it takes a bit to get there and, and, and the more businesses i can help to get to that place the better outstanding very powerful message mm. so where should we go to connect with you and consume your content andrewgriffiths.com is the easiest place uh to to find that's uh that people and I'd, anyone who's got any feedback or questions or ideas please you know, feel free to, uh, to reach out. Uh, I mean, I get back to everyone who reaches out to me. So um, feel free to drop me a, a line via my website. Absolutely. Well, we will certainly link to your website. We'll also post a link where you can purchase the book as Thank well. You. 
And so here's my final question to you. So what is one of the most valuable lessons that you've learned from a client that you didn't expect, but has had a significant impact on you personally and professionally? Uh, this is this is a really interesting one, and and it's it's a little bit um, bittersweet because that client actually just um, messaged me today to say that they've got breast cancer, and uh, and it's a it's a difficult thing. But in in, in working with this lady, uh, um, and I'd known her for a few years, um, about six months ago, she said that she wanted to do some coaching um, with me, and uh, and um, she'd sent me something. To review uh and i didn't respond uh as quickly as she wanted me to respond and um i remember getting an email from her saying that she was really disappointed that i hadn't responded she was disappointed i hadn't responded and i hadn't got back to her rah rah now my initial thing was you know how dare she i just i did a free webinar for her that week i'd done this i'd done oh you know Bye bye. And I'd written out this big grumpy email kind of going, well, you know, as a matter of fact, do, 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 do. and I realized that I was actually just really angry with myself because she was right. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't okay to take a week to get back to her about something that was really important to her. And, and I, I, I just sent her an email back and I said, you're absolutely right. I'm so sorry. That is not good enough. And it won't happen again. You know, uh, do you still want to go ahead? And she said, yes, of course. And, but we spoke about it and, and I know that I automatically went to the, all of my stuff, right. You know, but I did this and, and I offer great value and I do this and do this and do that. And, and it was, it's, it was a lovely reminder to bring that humility back into play. And sometimes the nicest thing to say is sorry and, uh, and, and not to leap down that path. And that was, that stuck with me. Uh, a lot in the, the and told me I needed to lift my game as well in, in that communication thing. I'd got a bit swamped. I'd got a bit behind, you know, it's not their fault. It's my fault. I've got to manage that better. I've got to, you know, get some help, do whatever it might be. And, uh, and as much as it irritated me and frustrated me, it embarrassed me more. So, you know, learning to manage my ego was what that was about. And that was a very, it was a very, very good lesson. And I'm grateful Excellent. to her for, for, for giving me that lesson. Well, thank you for sharing that lesson with all of us. And obviously we all wish her the best mm -hmm. and um, hopefully her health will improve. Mm -hmm. So Andrew, thank you so very much for being here. You are, you're an incredible human being and I'm, I'm just honored to have conversations like this with you. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation so much great content. And I, I just, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for sharing of your knowledge and wisdom with all of us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. And, and, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity and the, and the format and the forum and asking and researching. I mean, I don't know if your listeners know, but we had a, we had a, a, a conversation um, before Christmas just to really to see if we fit it, if our dynamics work, if, if my content was there. And, and, and I love the fact that you did that. You know, like you're so prepared. You're such a professional. And, uh, and, and so it makes it easy for me to just be who I am and to be up front and to just share my stories because you made such a great experience of it as well. And you're such a professional. So it kind of works both ways. My friend, you being so good at what you do brings out the best in your guests. And I'm pretty certain that that's what happens. Well, you're very kind. I'm grateful for you. Well, again, thank you. And for the rest of you, thank you so very much for watching and for listening. And please take a moment and subscribe to this channel and both Andrew and I would love it if you would share a comment or two of what you thought about this episode and maybe a takeaway or two. So please do that and to enjoy more episodes and to learn how Jay Shear Business Consulting can help your service-based business, visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com. And until next time, keep learning and growing. Make sure that you read, somebody has to be the most expensive. Why not make it you? And we'll see you on the next.
business minds coffee chat take care